Tonight, the historic handover from a president to the party's presidential hopeful. This is going to be a great week. A new beginning for the Democrats at their national convention. I stand before you now on this August night to report that democracy has prevailed. And the speech Joe Biden never wanted to give. Tragedy strikes off the Sicilian coast. After the storm was over, we noticed that the ship behind us was gone. The sunken super yacht and the high-profile passengers lost at sea. A first-hand look at the wildfire devastation and the road to recovery in Jasper. It's one of those, right? You, you know, we don't want to see it across the street when you're fine. Plus, the labor dispute that could stop the Canadian economy in its tracks. And remembering Phil Donahue. Shouldn't we have just a little more understanding? The trailblazing talk show host who paved the way for television giants. CTV National News with Omar Sachadina. Good evening, everyone. A historical political page turn at the Democratic National Convention in Chicago this evening. U.S. President Joe Biden receiving an emotional welcome as he walked on stage late tonight. And I'm not exaggerating. Because of you, we've had one of the most extraordinary four years of progress ever, period. <laughs> when I say we, I mean Kamala and me. Just think about it. COVID no longer controls our lives. We've gone from economic crisis to the strongest economy in the entire world. Violent crime has dropped to the lowest level of more than 50 years. And crime will keep coming down when we put a prosecutor in the Oval Office instead of a convicted felon. Let's bring in CTV's chief political correspondent, Vashi Capellos. Now, and Vashi, not the speech that Biden wanted to give, but he delivered it with a lot of fire, a lot of passion, conviction, the kind of energy many probably wished he demonstrated before he stepped aside and very much defending his record and Harris's tonight. Yeah, I think if this Joe Biden had showed up to that initial debate, we might not be having this type of conversation tonight. At least that's what I think the assessment in the room is so far. He certainly is bringing a lot of fire to this speech. And you're totally right to hit on what I think is a very purposeful strategic move on his part, which is every time he talks about his administration's accomplishments as he views them or the things that he has done as president, he says, and we played it there briefly in that clip, and he's saying it right now behind me, that he, um, uh, that he and Kamala did it, right? He keeps bringing her into the conversation, very much trying to present that this this their accomplishments what they they could do more for americans what they have done in the past is is a team effort that hasn't always been the case i think it's a very deliberate effort tonight and showing that unity now switching gears talking about kamala harris she made a surprise but brief appearance earlier this evening part of her challenge will be to keep up this momentum and energy but also to win over those undecideds and trump supporters who feel like their government is broken especially in those key battleground states so what is the political strategy for her moving forward. Yeah, part of this convention is, of course, to motivate their base, but you're totally right to point out that there's a lot of other Americans that have to come out, particularly in those swing states. There's 500,000 people, basically, who ultimately will decide the election. The idea tonight has very much been, and I think throughout the week, to play up her experience, the kinds of things she's done, the fact that she doesn't come from an ultra-rich background. They're trying to make her relatable to the exact voters that you point out, Omar. All right, Vashi Capello in Chicago tonight. Vashi, thank you. And and to take us through what led to this moment late this evening, CTV's Washington Bureau Chief Joy Malvin also at the United Center in Chicago tonight. Joy. Omar, this convention has opened with a burst of enthusiasm as Joe Biden passes the torch to his successor, Kamala Harris. The party trying to take this new vibe and turn it into votes. President Joe Biden arrived in Chicago to deliver a speech he never wanted to give. 
bittersweet, even painful, to give up his quest for a second term as president in favor of his successor and a new generation, Kamala Harris. Asked by reporters if he's ready. Are you ready to pass the torch? Yes, sir. It's a memorable moment, even historic, after that disastrous debate and revolt in his own party to step aside, Biden said he put country first, giving them a chance to win. <laughs> Harris in a few short weeks has pumped new energy into the race. And this November we will come together and declare with one voice, as one people, we are moving forward. Tonight, Biden made the case that Donald Trump is still a threat to democracy and must be defeated. And he's hopeful Harris will finish the job. Let's salute President Biden. He has been democracy's champion at home and abroad. Hillary Clinton, the last woman to try and break through that glass ceiling in 2016, losing to Donald Trump, <laughs> grinned and urged Democrats to make history. This is our time, America. This is when we stand up. This is when we break through. The future is here. It's in our grasp. Let's go win it. The enthusiasm for the vice president has translated into new national polls showing Harris is edging out Donald Trump for the first time. The former president is counter-programming in battleground states, but not always staying on message. I'm better looking than she is. The whole world's watching. And some tense moments here as protesters took to the streets and breached a barricade, riot police blocking them from the convention. What was mostly a peaceful march, they're angry at Biden and Harris too over Israel's war in Gaza, demanding America end its support to Israel or lose their vote. It's hard to imagine just a month ago, Democrats were bracing to lose. Now with Harris at the top of the ticket, Biden's legacy is tied to hers. And you can feel the energy in this room as they give Biden a hero's welcome. Omar? All right, Joy, thanks. America's top diplomat says Israel's prime minister has agreed to a U.S. proposal to secure a ceasefire in Gaza and free the remaining hostages. He confirmed to me that Israel accepts the bridging proposal, uh, that he supports it. Antony Blinken spoke after meeting Benjamin Netanyahu for nearly three hours. The announcement puts new pressure on Hamas that has called the proposal biased towards Israel. <laughs> Blinken also met relatives of American hostages in Tel Aviv while outside the hotel. The desperation for a deal was palpable. Unfortunately for us, the Israeli government is not doing its best. I want my son to be free. I want my son back home. Despite the American optimism, both Israel and Hamas have signaled that a breakthrough may be difficult. Canada's Liberal Party has become the latest major group distancing itself from Ottawa's Pride Parade for a pro-Palestinian position held by the organizers. Ottawa's largest school board had also joined in. The Liberal Party says it will hold its own event instead. The federal political party's decision comes as some embassies, civil servants and local organizations pulled out of the event following the controversy. The statement by the organizers on August 6th that criticized Israel also condemned the October 7th Hamas attack. Canada has pledged $1 million to help combat MPOX in Africa days after it was declared a global health emergency. Foreign Affairs Minister Melanie Jolie made the announcement during a visit to the Ivory Coast. The funding will go to the World Health Organization to speed up detection of the virus and research. MPOX has killed more than 500 people this year. Global Affairs Canada says it is aware of reports that a Canadian has died after a luxury super yacht sank off the coast of Sicily. At least one person is dead and six others are missing, including a British tech tycoon. CTV's Paul Hollingsworth has more on the rescue and the recovery efforts. 
A violent storm capsized and sank the luxury yacht Bayesian early Monday morning. The yacht's owner, British technology tycoon Mike Lynch, and his 18-year-old daughter Hannah are among the missing. Twelve passengers and ten crew members were on board when the yacht sank. Can we watch the ship behind us? Karsten Borner, captain of a ship anchored nearby, said he watched the yacht struggle to stay afloat as the storm intensified. And after the, the storm was over, we noticed that the ship behind us was gone. To underscore the fierce nature of this sudden and violent storm this morning, one local fisherman said he was watching this luxury yacht closely and said it sank and disappeared within seconds. Borner discovered a life raft with 15 survivors from the Bayesian, including Lynch's wife and a one-year-old baby. The baby's mother told an Italian newspaper she used all of her strength to save her child. Four people injured. Three heavy injured, yeah. and uh, we brought them to our ship. All 15 survivors were treated at a nearby hospital. Divers have reached the yacht's hull 160 feet below sea level as the search for the six missing passengers continues. Paul Hollingsworth, CTV News, Halifax. A small community west of Toronto is pulling together to rebuild tonight after coming in the path of a powerful tornado. It's just absolutely amazing that uh, no one was injured down in that district and that all the homes are still standing. The tornado ripped the roofs off these structures that store fertilizer. Next door debris also littering the community's soccer field. The fire chief says a children's tournament scheduled for that day had been previously cancelled. This home hardware store, nearly destroyed in the weekend storm, will likely need to be demolished. There is a risk of coastal flooding in Newfoundland as Hurricane Ernesto passes through the region. Environment Canada is expecting the storm to bring large waves along with heavy rain to the St. John's area. Canada's Hurricane Centre is predicting the storm will weaken as it moves over colder waters off Newfoundland and Labrador tomorrow. And days after residents in Jasper started returning home for the first time since that devastating wildfire four weeks ago, a closer look today at the destruction and what the road to recovery will look like. CTV's Kathy Lee reports. A gallery of devastation, the air thick with the scent of charred memories. There is nothing else to do but take it all in. The east end of town looks like never happened, nothing happened there. Eh? You come over here, it looks like a war zone. It's hard to believe, it's like, more like a nightmare. It's a nightmare many won't wake up from. Some homes now in ruins. Basically a pile of ashes and uh, debris, you know. A few things I recognize, but most of it I don't know what it is. This man owned the LNW family restaurant. It too, gone. It's hard. It's a heartbreaking. You work 60 years and all over Sunday, one night, you lose everything. A third of the town was destroyed by wildfire more than three weeks ago, most of the damage on the west side. The fire was indiscriminate. On one side of the street, houses untouched. On the other, complete destruction. It's crazy. It's kind of surreal. Like, it's a lot different than the photos once you see it in real life. The wildfire now being held. We're not expecting any future growth or any threat to the municipality at this time. Declared on the day Morgan Kitchen was remembered. The 24-year-old Calgarian died fighting the wildfire. His bravery not lost on Jasper. That's more painful. And there will be other moments of pain on the long road to recovery. Many resolved to rebuild. Others still uncertain. I kind of wonder, if I, should I rebuild or should I take my money and go elsewhere? Only people in Jasper, business owners and professionals helping them are allowed in the town. RCMP members are patrolling the area to ensure non-Jasper residents stay away for now. Kathy Lee, CTV News, Jasper, Alberta. A couple of major business headlines to tell you about tonight. General Motors is laying off more than a thousand salaried employees at its software and service units worldwide, including a, quote, small percentage here in Canada. GM says half of the cuts are in the U.S., including about 600 positions at GM's tech campus near Detroit. The company claims it's not about cost cuts, but comes after a review of operations following the departure of an executive VP of 
software and services. A looming lockout or strike at Canada's two main rail companies could begin as early as Thursday. Barring any last-minute agreements, the vast majority of all goods transported by rail would grind to a halt, causing a potentially crippling impact on Canada's economy. CTV's Annie Bergeron-Oliver reports. On an average day, more than $1 billion worth of goods are carried on Canada's railways. But with the likelihood of a strike growing, more shipments are being cut back, bringing pain to businesses. There's no really any plan B uh, available for uh, businesses. It's not like suddenly they can call up a trucking company. Shipments requiring refrigeration, including meats and some medicines, have already been halted by CN and CP Rail, as have shipments of hazardous materials. And today, the world's largest overseas cargo carrier, Mersic, is no longer accepting large shipments destined for Canadian railways. This is a serious and urgent uh, uh, concern for us. There's nothing more important than uh, an, an economy that's potentially about to shut down. CN says negotiations are ongoing and blames the Teamsters Union for dragging out the process. Until this weekend, the Teamsters have not put forward any counter offers on any points whatsoever. We received one offer from them over the weekend, but we still remain too far apart. The union, however, is accusing the railways of offering proposals that would make working conditions worse. Both CN and CPKC are trying to erode protections in our collective agreement around scheduling, around fatigue, around rest. With the two sides seemingly far apart, industry associations are calling for the federal labour minister to prevent a strike by either introducing back-to-work legislation or forcing the parties into binding arbitration. We cannot accept perishable good to go to waste for uh, this kind of negotiation. In a statement issued today, the federal labour minister called on all parties to do the work necessary at the bargaining table, Omar, to avoid a work stoppage. Annie Bergeron-Oliver in Ottawa tonight. Annie, thank you. Coming up... This is like a giant swallowing another giant. A Canadian company makes a big international move, plus honouring a TV talk show legend. Quebec-based convenience store giant Couchetard has made a multi-billion dollar takeover bid for the Japanese owner of 7-Eleven. It's a complicated deal that, if approved, would cement its status as the world's biggest player in the market. CTV's Heather Wright has the details. No stranger to buying up its competition, Couchetard has never gone after a rival this big, offering a reported $30 billion for the Japanese operator of 7-Eleven. This is like a giant swallowing another giant, which is uh, glamorous. Um, but but I get nervous of these type of deals because they, they, they don't always work. Seven and I announced today it has received an offer from Canadian-based Alimentation Couchetard to take over all 85,000 of its retail locations. Seven and I is valued at roughly $38 billion, while Couchetard, which also owns Circle K and On the Run, has a valuation of around $58 billion. If approved, this would be the largest foreign acquisition of a Japanese company. Japan historically has had a pretty strong reputation, the Japanese government, of saying no thanks to foreign deals. But supposedly some of that has loosened up a bit in the last little while. Last year, Japan changed its merger and acquisition guidelines, aimed at encouraging companies to give serious consideration to legitimate takeover offers from foreigners. 7&I says the deal offered by Couchetard is preliminary and non-binding. A committee has been set up to review the deal. We're looking at a very uh, complicated transaction uh, involving several countries. So 7&I uh, is actually, or 7-Eleven, is actually in uh, 19 countries. Couchetard is in 31 countries. So it will be a complicated transaction for sure. In recent months, 7i has been the target of activist investors, some even calling for the company CEO to step down. Any merger would very likely be subjected to regulatory scrutiny, as these are the two biggest convenience store companies in the world. Heather Wright, CTV News, Toronto. Still ahead. The slippery new Stanley Cup tradition.
The Stanley Cup was brought to Windsor, Ontario over the weekend by Florida Panthers player Aaron Ekblad. He is the latest to take part in a unique celebration, the hockey star bringing home the sport's highest award to a local restaurant and helping himself to some fresh pasta straight out of the cup. Wonder if it tastes better that way. And if you look up at the sky tonight, you may be able to catch a glimpse of a rare super blue moon. Parts of the world are already witnessing the celestial event, which is both a supermoon, when the moon is at its closest point to Earth in its orbit, and a blue moon, which isn't actually blue, but refers to the phenomenon when there are two full moons in a single month. The next super blue moon is projected to happen in 2037. After the break. Ducks oh. just love this smooth show. <laughs> Tributes pour in for a pioneering television journalist. The entertainment world is mourning the loss of talk show host pioneer Phil Donahue, who has died at the age of 88. Reflecting on his legacy, Oprah took to Instagram posting this photo, writing, there wouldn't have been an Oprah show without Phil Donahue being the first to prove that daytime talk and women watching should be taken seriously. CTV's Andrea Case has the story. The road to the Phil Donahue show was one hard fought. Hired at a radio station in Ohio in 1957, 22-year-old Cleveland native Phil Donahue got his first opportunity in broadcasting when a radio announcer didn't show up for work and he stepped up to the microphone. Moving from radio to television, Donahue worked as a freelancer for the CBS Evening News and later an anchor of the morning newscast in Ohio. In 1967, he launched the Phil Donahue Show. It was the first to include the audience's voice live and on the telephone. Because in my day... His show tackled controversial topics including racism, AIDS, and poverty. Donahue's a show was renamed, ran for 29 years, ending in 1996. Oprah said, and I have the quote here, he was the first to acknowledge that women are interested in more than mascara tips and cake recipes that were intelligent. We're concerned with the world around us and we want the best possible things for our lives. She says without the Phil Donahue show, there would be no Oprah Winfrey show. It won 20 Emmy Awards, a Peabody Award, and earlier this year, Joe Biden awarded him the Presidential Medal of Freedom. Freedom. Married first in 1958 to Margaret Cooney, they had five children. Raised Catholic, he admitted he wasn't a good Catholic. They divorced in 1977. I'm upstaging you. <laughs> Don't oh. you just love this smooth show? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's how you got out of Dayton, huh? Uh, Three years later, when actress and activist Marlo Thomas was a guest on his show, they clicked and were married for 44 years. The talk show served as Cupid. He went on to be a writer, a film producer, and podcaster. Donahue died after a long, undisclosed illness with his family and his beloved golden retriever, Charlie, by his side. Phil Donahue was 88 years old. Andrea Case, CTV News, Toronto. And that's a snapshot of this Monday for all of us at CTV National News. Thank you for watching. Good night and see you tomorrow.